here today. Now, given that we might not be together in person again for a while, this is something you might want to have. So our happy uh, grad students are ready to serve you. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to the people who are able to join us here in person and welcome to all of you that are live streaming. Uh, this is the first time that we've live streamed an event and so uh, just like all of the new online accommodations, you're just going to be lovingly patient with us if it's a little, it takes a little time for transitions. Um, in 1970, the Women's Studies uh, program at San Diego State became the first in the nation and this is our 50th anniversary year. When we thought about ways that we wanted to celebrate 50 years, it came up that it was time to do something we always talk about doing, 
right, which is to uh, build stronger, better, more bridges with our allies, our compañeras in Tijuana. Um, feminist, feminist academics who are our neighbors, and yet for all of the reasons that we know, it's uh, complicated and difficult to form alliances across the border. And so we are thrilled that our uh, event in honor of International Women's Day, which was actually the eighth, um, is a panel of really extraordinary, extraordinary scholars and activists who I think that you will um, be so impressed by and informed by, and I believe you will come away with a better understanding of, of, of feminism, of the status of women in Baja, um, and many other things that you didn't even know you were gonna learn about today. So our panel is Women's Status and Feminist Influence in Baja, California, Context, Intersectionality, Advances, and Challenges. Uh, before I go any further, I wanna thank Heidi Doyle, who is our lifeline to everything and who will be doing the live streaming. And now I want to hand it over to uh, my friend, Liz Mayer, uh, Doctora Mayer is a Profesora de uh, Estudios Culturales, right? In COLEF, El Colegio de la Frontera Norte, uh, our partner organization in this event. And uh, Doctora Mayer has done really all the work of bringing together the speakers that you're going to hear and organizing this panel for us. And uh, she will also present her comments and insights as well. And so I'm going to now become, hand the event over and uh, fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be an excellent, excellent afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doreen. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Okay, the first part that I'm presenting is not part of my 12 minutes, okay? It's the presentation of the panel. So I'd like to say thank you to all of you for being here, particularly in virus times. Um, special thanks to Women's Studies Department, to the Global Affairs, to COLEF, to the Colegio de la Frontera Norte, College of Arts and Letters, and of course, to the new president of San Diego State, Adelaide del Castillo, and for making this event possible. It is an honor to, to um, it's an honor to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Women's Studies Department with this panel about women's situation, feminism, and women's rights in Baja California. You know, when Doreen invited me, she said something like, you can be a perfect bridge. And I've been working in the border region now for 26 years. Um, I ha but I've lived before that in what's known in the border region as deep Mexico. I lived in Oaxaca for 10 years, 20 years in Mexico City and other parts. And that gave me the opportunity both as participating as a feminist and NGO activist, gave me the opportunity to really learn about the culture, about economic and political differences, cultural, economic, political differences between the two countries. And um, I, then I became a very late blooming academic, like in, in, the, in the 2000s, you know? And, and since then have been that. The opportunity to be immersed in Mexican culture has been enormously transformative and enriching for me. And as residents of the border region, we all have that opportunity. It's incredible how little we take advantage of it. I know that the border is very difficult now and it's almost a bad word, but um, it really it's very possible to go over and you can communicate with us and we will look for the way of doing that. Um, hopefully the panel will contribute to building that so needed bridge over the troubled waters of our turbulent borderline times. It almost makes me cry. So now the, the PowerPoint. Um, now, I, uh, last thing, the main goal that I had in organizing the panel was to diversify as much as possible, both in terms of themes, subjects, and ages. Because my tendency was to go for the 70-year-olds, you know, or the 60 year let's do it. And, and then I said, no, let's, let's branch out a little. 
but all of a sudden I thought, well, maybe we need a little introduction to this. So I'm giving the academic, very boring introduction of feminism, both in the United States, I'm from New York originally, and had the first moments of the wave in New York and then the rest in Mexico. So I'm going to try and give a presentation that touches a little on United States and feminism as an emergent second wave issue in, in the end of the 60s, and then how it was imported across the border and became a transnational discourse and was assumed and transformed by Mexican feminists and how Mexican feminism transformed feminism. So, yeah, okay. I can't see it, so I'm, I, I know. <laughs> I know. So luck, luckily I, I printed up, so here we go. Um, let's talk about second wave feminisms. It's been so criticized lately and I feel like really defensive about it. So I'd like to uh, just try and be as abstract as possible, but my feeling is that it was one of the most dynamic, transformative, cultural discourses and political movements of the 20th century. Distinct, there were distinct tendencies, different tendencies who had different strategies, different ways of getting close to what feminism was. There was the liberal strategy which said, let's work within the government, let's work to change laws. Now these all, they, they cross borders also, there really isn't any pure strategy. But then there was the radical or cultural uh, strategy, which was like, okay, patriarchy is the root of all evil, and that's what we have to transform, and the state is patriarchal, and everything else is. And then there was, yes, and then there was the socialist tendency, with Marxist tendency, socialist tendency, which was, okay, as soon as the revolution happens, uh, we are going to uh, be, begin working on women's rights. But what the socialist tendency did, which I feel that I was part of, but, uh, and I didn't do it theoretically, but other people did, what the socialist tendency did was to really restructure Marxism, to see how women were absent from Marxism, and that their jobs as uh, being in the private se uh, sector were totally ignored as a part of the economic dynamic. So we did new categories, new concepts, new epistems, new paradigms, and all those together rewrote history with a capital H, his story, and included her story, as they say, and also in many academic fields. So what was the methodology of this movement? This, and I suggest this to everyone because it really was a wonderful thing, sort of like group therapy. We had uh, little, small consciousness-raising groups but this was in a moment, and when my time is over, it's going to be over. So this was in a moment when women were absent linguistically and presentially from any record of human history. So when we got together, what we discussed was our own, were our own individual problems. And then we noticed that everyone else had the same problems. And so those... That, those small consciousness raising groups were how personal experience were transformed into shared claims, how they became collective discoveries of new truths. So then we have the motto, which is the personal is political. That also blew up the world porque, because, porque, porque, um, that changed the meaning of what political was. And it, it, localized political as being part of the power relations. What? Uh, yeah, okay, yes. As uh, local, localized uh, the political as being part of power relations, not part of a political party or part of the Congress, you know, part of others. And it even constructed after time, thanks to Foucault and others, the political body. The political body that had impressions graved, uh, engraved on it. Initially, woman, was, which is the subject of feminism, was universalized and essentialized, in spite of the fact that both heterosexual women and lesbian women formed the first movements, but the tendency was 
to focus on the heterosexual demands. Very quickly in the United States, lesbian, Afro-American, and Chicana feminists, academics, and activists exposed their distinct realities, needs, and claims, and totally interrogated the notion of universal womanhood. It became relativized by distinct intersectionalities. So, second wave feminism in the United States and in, 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 in the other highly developed countries where it came from, um, decried gender oppression and discrimination, massively took to the streets. Uh, I remember a protest where there were over a, a million women in Washington, theorized, consolidated new discourses of gender intersectionality, democracy, and citizenship. What is democracy? What is citizenship without women? And what is it with women? How does that transform? Uh, it seeded a new habitus, uh, I'm gonna just borrow a category there, and uh, which is the interjection into the profoundness both of your body gestures and your unconscious. It seeded a new habitus of gender equality. And today's protest that we saw in Mexico on Sunday and for the past few days, the strike where women didn't go to work yesterday, today's protest movements expand, deepen, and consolidate this habitus. Most of them are very young. They were born not feeling that their experience wasn't at all included in categories. Okay. I am going to, I think there are a number of points that pertain to both Mexico and the United States. One, I know this sounds very wonky academic, but the consolidation of a middle class, because the majority of the feminists, both in both countries, came from the middle class. The legalization and availability of birth control that gave you the right to exercise your sexuality without getting pregnant every time. No? And uh, here, I don't have the rest, so um, I'm going to have to... Oh, other social movements, very important. In Mexico, I'm not going to go into the United States, it was civil rights, et cetera, et cetera against the war. But uh, in Mexico, the 1968 student movement, which ended in disaster, um, uh, in all these movements, women participated because there was a changing gender dynamic where women participated publicly now, where they didn't before. But they were always, it, it, it was one or two exceptions, the helpers, you know, the mimeographers in the United States, the one that made the sandwiches, the one yet thanks to the pill that could go to bed with the leaders, you know, all that sexuality was exercised, but, but um, the leaders were men. And that was part of the working consciousness of feminists, of, of, of individual feminists who had that as an experience. Then Simone de Beauvoir came, we read the books, we read the other books, and we were like, okay. So Mexico, different national histories, different cultural influences, different degrees of industrial development. In Mexico, there wasn't a majority middle class, there was a minority middle class. So that the rever reverberations initially of that feminism, of that very middle class feminism that really focused on the body and of equal opportunities, equal, equal opportunities in the body, but had no um, other class implications, other race implications, other ethnicity implications. And that minority middle class had much more social capital. So they had access to television programs, to, uh, to journalism, to, to, to universities, obviously, but had much more access to, defu defu to, to spread the word. No? And then, of course, there were different political models. Uh, Marta Lamas calls the Mexican one absent citizenship. I'm not sure that that's true, but feminism became a transnational discourse and cross borders. I'm going to resume here. And this, the point of this is to introduce what happened in Baja California, which is very different from what happened in Mexico City. The, se the 70s were a very similar replica of what happened in the United States, in France, in Italy. Middle class, upper middle class women who got together in the little consciousness raising groups and had the demands of sexual freedom, uh, abortion, equal rights, and uh, an end to gender discrimination. Uh, there were the consciousness raising groups. And then, of course, there was the big 
UN Women's Conference in 75, which took place in Mexico City, and which the feminists didn't go to, but were influenced by. And they became aware after that conference that they needed to make alliances. And alliances, both interclass and intersectorial, have been identified as the biggest contribution of Latin American feminism to global feminism. The need to make alliances and what that, those alliances did, because they weren't just alliances with your demands, they were conversations between distinct sectors, uh, groups, et cetera, and so we had to negotiate demands. One of the biggest alliances, um, the Letters of Fenelidum, it doesn't matter, it was a li women's liberation alliance, uh, was with feminists from the feminist groups, unions, and political parties. And here you can see that the demands change. Equal pay for equal work, daycare centers, legalization of abortion, and an end to domestic violence. In the 80s, uh, the 80s, uh, I don't have that page here, but I know it because I lived it. Uh, the 80s, <laughs> the 80s, um, uh, promoted something that the original feminists don't, uh, don't really love. They think it wasn't really feminism, but okay. What, how many? Two? Got it. Okay. Uh, they, they think it wasn't really feminism, but I lived it, and I think it was absolute feminism. There was an alliance between the socialist feminists and what is called the MOOP, uh, the grassroots urban movements. And that was very popular because of the, of the development, the industrial development, there was a ton of migration from the rural areas to the cities, but there weren't enough jobs. So all these ghetto areas, all these low income areas developed all around Mexico City and the other cities. And they had organizations whose job was to negotiate, to be intermediaries with the state, with the government, the local governments, et cetera, for their demands. So we started working with the women from the MOOP, who were working class women, mostly housewives, but uh, they would like sell tacos, sell uh, uh, empanadas, sell, sell other things uh, in order to complement income. Uh, I have to say the last point I want to make was that uh, in the 90s, the neoliberal model was consolidated and was very consolidated in Mexico. It eliminated most of the social programs, so it affected most of the social movements. You know, they had nothing to negotiate. There was nothing there anymore. So we even, we activists were told, start working within the state. You know, there's, that's the only funding you're going to get from Oxfam, from wherever. You're not going to get funding for your NGO if you do anything else. So that was one thing. And then all the opposition movements, or relatively all of them, began working as um, advisors to, or, or elected officials or whatever. So then there were the new international conventions for the defense of women's rights, and that in Mexico Trans, uh, one second, translated to uh, the acceptance of all that, that Mexico, differently from the United States, signed all these conventions and is obligated, obligated to promote women's rights. So we have the women's institutes, we have the fe new federal laws and programs on all levels. And then finally was the Zapatista Women's Uprising in 1994, which, um, made indigenous women a real subject in, in the national conversation, you know? And you saw them as commanders, as leaders of the community. They weren't the discriminated subhuman beings that they had been thought of as before. So those are really the, the that's the, the context. And recent years, you can see it up there, is a new push for feminism from younger people. So there we are. You can ask about that at the end. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't present that. So the, the next, and she has a very long, 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 long history. 
Okay, the ne our next speaker is um, Licenciada Minerva Najara. She is a feminist, a lawyer, and a defender of women's human rights in Baja California. I'd say she's fundamental, one of the best, if not the best. She's the mother of Alonso, that's very important, and co-editor of two libros, regional libros on abortion in Latin America and violence against women by CLADEM, which is a, an international organization. She, um, uh, okay, F for that organization, she co-elaborated the first inf uh, informe, 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 report, thank you, about, about the situation in 2000, um, about the feminicide situation in Juarez. She's the co-editor of the Program of Human Rights um, in Baja California and author of the different Di very distinct lays, laws, programs, and pol public policies. And without uh, waiting anymore, I present you to Minerva Najera. She will present in Spanish, and our friend um, Antonieta Mercado from USC is going to is going to translate. Oh, thank you. Uh, who, who speaks Spanish here? Could you raise your hand? Yeah, a lot of you. A lot of, yeah, a lot of you, nice. So I'm going to be, for those of you who don't speak Spanish, I'm going to be translating. Uh, so I hope it'll go a little bit slower, but I'll do my best to translate quickly. Adelante, Minerva. Muchísimas gracias. The problem is the time. Uh, a little time uh, and much information and experience. Thank you so much. Eh, mi presentación habla de un desarrollo de vi vivencial eh, en el cual he podido eh, transitar como feminista, abogada, madre y ahora una feminista eh, dedicada de tiempo completo a construir un mejor espacio para la vida de las mujeres. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, time is, <laughs> is needed. Um, I would like to talk about my life development transition as a feminist, uh, as a lawyer, and um, now as another feminist uh, fighting for the rights of women. Eh, para hablar de esta pequeño pedazo de historia, eh, ne es necesario eh, poner contexto. Eh, de dónde, desde dónde lo hablo. Y lo hablo desde mi experiencia fronteriza y baja californiana. And for this, I have to make context. Uh, I talk about feminism from my uh, border experience and from my baja california experience. En, yo llego a los seis años de vida en mi, uh, baja california en 1968. Ocho, y encuentro un estado joven, el estado 29 de la República Mexicana, que fue declarada estado en 1952. Um, I arrived at six uh, years old in 1968 at Baja California, a young state, which is the 29th in the Mexican Republic and was declared an independent state in 1952. Aquí, cruzando la frontera, donde cruzarla no requería de pasaporte, lo mismo era ir a comprar la leche a la tienda de México que a la tienda de Estados Unidos. To cross the border, you didn't need a passport. Uh, you could go and buy milk on a store in the United States or on a store in Mexico in your everyday life. Encontrar que en Baja California eh, se instaura las, uh, empre las empresas de la industria de, ma de la maquiladora con un proyecto de, obviamente, este, de neoliberaliz neoliberalista, capitalista neoliberalista, de incrementar de mayor manera las ganancias. In Baja California, I encountered the arrival of neoliberalism in the, in the form of uh, maquiladora, uh, manufacturing industries that uh, arrive to increase their, their earnings. 
Empresas sobre todo de Estados Unidos, Japón, Corea, pero del Oriente, en menos medida de Canadá y de algunos otros países. Um, those maquiladores came from Korea, Japan, uh, the United States, and other Canada and other countries. Ello convirtió Baja California en un polo de atracción de la mano de obra, de hombres y mujeres, sobre todo de hombres y cada vez más de mujeres. Uh, California became a, a magnet for the work of women, men, but mostly women who work in this maquiladora. La atracción de la industria maquiladora eh, que se instaura sin pagar salarios iguales que acá, pero tampoco respetando las leyes laborales de aquel lado. Maquiladoras established themselves paying, of course, less salary, uh, lesser salary than in the United States, but they also didn't respect the labor laws on the Mexican side. Que cada vez se encuentra que la mano de obra femenina es más eh, productiva, más dócil, cada vez mayor, y que empieza a eh, desarrollar condiciones laborales que trastocan los cuerpos femeninos. Um, maquiladoras found women's labor more docile, easier to manage, and the dynamics that they form working in those places is that the, the, those dynamics were affecting and transforming women's bodies. Eh, condiciones violatorias de derechos humanos eh, que obviamente no ocurrían aquí, como eh, instaurar maquiladoras sin puertas en los sanitarios, eh, pedir la toalla sanitaria sangrante para acceder a un empleo y colocar puertas metálicas que cerraban al final de la jornada sin siquiera pedirles autorización si querían trabajar horas extras a las mujeres. There were things that were never observed in the, on this side of the border, like uh, human rights violations, violations like um, uh, having bathrooms with no doors, um, asking uh, employees for their female pads at the end of each month to check if they were pregnant, or close the doors uh, for making the women working extra time even if, uh, when they were not asked to do that. Hom hombres, pero sobre todo mujeres cada vez más de edades en donde no se pedía ningún requisito más que el cuerpo para trabajar y en donde eh, regresaron las mujeres a lo que habían ganado en la época industrial o a finales de los 900, que es la jornada de trabajo. The jobs that were created in these maquiladoras uh, attracted men, but mainly, increasingly women, and the only requirement for them to work there was their body. And uh, they started to make salaries that were comparable to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Esa jornada de trabajo que ganamos las mujeres gracias a Roxa Luxemburgo y Clara Zetkin, que empezaron en la revolución industrial a reclamar justamente la jornada de derechos de las mujeres y de los hombres. That um, compensation that we made uh, due to the gains, to the struggles that Rosa Luxemburgo and Clara Setting went precisely during that time to make the conditions of women and men better as workers. En este estado joven eh, de puertas abiertas a la inversión, en donde las revistas de economía eh, cantaban victorias porque más del 51% de las mujeres producían la riqueza de este estado. Uh, the economic magazines were cheering that in this young state more than um, the, the wealth was produced by 51% of their women. Y, donde, y en donde... Siempre hubo y ahora menos carencia de guarderías para los niños y las niñas. Falta de inspección de las condiciones laborales por parte de la autoridad laboral. Falta de atención en las instancias de justicia cuando las mujeres iban a quejarse de que las acosaban o las hostigaban y les decían que eso no era un delito, sino eso era natural o ellas eran quienes lo provocaban a los patrones. And it was very common that um, in a state that there's already lacking child, child care, there was less and less child care available for women. 
uh, lack of inspections of the conditions of labor by the labor authorities and uh, widespread harassment from bosses. And despite the fact that women will complain with labor authorities, they will be accused of provoking the situations or not being paid attention at all. En, es, en ese contexto me toman por asalto un grupo de feministas y me invitan a una célula feminista, una célula de una organización política de izquierda en donde se estudiaba feminismo justamente. That is the context where a group of feminists invite me to a feminist cell where I started to study feminism um, and we studied a lot of uh, feminist writers and Así como no había guarderías, tampoco la tierra estaba regulada. La tierra pertenecía a los funcionarios o si este, tenías una buena tierra, el funcionario iba y te la, te la quitaba o te la robaba. Eso sigue pasando actualmente. The same way that there was not a child care available for women workers, the land was also not regulated and if anybody wanted your, your land, uh, authorities might have uh, a right to your land, they will just strip that from you. Las poblaciones más pobres se asentaron en lo que se conoce como el lecho del río, si hablamos de Tijuana, pero también en unas zonas similares, si hablamos de Mexicali, eh, o también en otros, en otras partes de los municipios como Rosarito y Tecate. Poor people established themselves on the banks of the river, Tijuana River and in other places in, uh, Tijuana, in Baja in Mexicali and Tecate. Hay, así hay cinturones de gente que está eh, luchando, estamos luchando por la tierra, por la regularización de la tierra que, en la que vivimos. Y eso se convierte en una bandera en todo Baja California, tener un título de tu tierra que compraste. In the outskirts of the cities in Baja California, uh, a lot of poor people me, including myself, are fighting to get the regularization of those lands, of the, of the land where we live. Um, uh, so we have, we have access to that. Uh, yo terminaba la primaria cuando me pedían grupos de mujeres del movimiento urbano popular de cinco colonias que se juntaban y se reunían para luchar por la tierra. Si yo que sabía escribir porque tenía mecanografía en mi en mi primaria, <laughs> podía hacer los volantes para convocar al mitin y después si sí podía hacer eh, un, una demanda para mm, ir a luchar por la tierra. Así empecé. I started when I was in elementary school. My school had a, a, a typing machines and the women who were fighting in, the, in five neighborhoods asked me if I could help them doing the flyers and helping organizing the, um, doing the organization for these struggles. Y yo empecé a, a trabajar porque, bueno, soy de una familia de 11 hijos e hijas donde mi madre, eh, que no se nombraba feminista, pero que fue mi maestra y sigue siendo mi maestra, era parte de, las, de ese grupo de líderes de la comunidad. Y al final que yo salía de trabajar, de, saliendo de mi primaria y después de la secundaria, me estaban esperando para dictarme el volante o el, la demanda ante las autoridades. My mother, who had 11 children, I have all 11 siblings, um, was part of one of those groups and I, they will call me when I was in elementary school and then when I started junior high, to dictate to me the demands of those of the, of the groups. Fue paralelo entre que iba al movimiento urbano popular y que militaba en la célula feminista de emancipación, el primer grupo feminista de Baja California, eh, donde fui eh, viviendo y pero también conviviendo con otras mujeres, con otras mujeres feministas de otros grupos que fueron surgiendo, que le fueron eh, eh, acompañando también a lo que fue el grupo Emancipación eh, en Tijuana, que después se convertiría en el grupo Factor X, luego con una historia, con un símbolo de un caracol, porque nos reuníamos en los parques o, o en las calles o en los cafés para platicar sobre los derechos de las mujeres. 
y dar talleres en las colonias? Um, uh, that's how I joined the Urban Popular Movement, which is an organization as well in Baja California. And later I joined the Feminist Emancipation Cell that was composed by a, a, a group of women who were starting to fight um, This organization, the, the Emancipation Cell, became the Tijuana Factor X, which had a, a symbol, a shell as a symbol, a snail as a symbol. Y, y bueno, en esa lógica no había, de, no había de otra, era claro, tenía que ser abogada, aparte de que yo creo que me venía un poco de la sangre. Y supe que tenía que estudiar abogacía para defender la tierra, pero para defender los derechos desde el feminismo, desde la defensa de los derechos de las mujeres. Y con estos grupos que después se fueron haciendo en el resto del Estado, grupos como en Mexicali el grupo Alay de Fopa, eh, en Mexicali también almacén de los recursos que hacía trabajo en las comunidades. Grupos también como el grupo Xochiquetzal, también en Tijuana. Grupos. Yeah. Uh, this is why I, I knew that I had to be a lawyer, that I had to defend the land, but also I had to defend women. This is how uh, I made contacts with groups such as the Mexicali form Alay de Fopa and the Xochiquetzal group. Xochiquetzal, también en Tijuana, Patronato para Almacén de los Recursos en Mexicali, eh, Medicina Social Comunitaria, también en Tijuana con un proyecto de salud estupendo, eh, Grupo Olimpia de Gauch en el municipio de Tecate. Uh, there are several groups that I couldn't, uh, do you have the, the list of the groups? Ok, varios grupos que después eh, prohijaron lo que fue un proyecto de promotoras comunitarias que existe aún como un legado. From all these groups, there was a, a group, uh, started a group of uh, community promoters that is still around as a legacy. Ya en el estudio de la abogacía, me eh, in, hago trabajo de asesoría en las mujeres de los grupos como trabajo voluntario, pero entro a trabajar el tema de derechos humanos. Y es ahí donde tendemos puentes con, estratégicamente con actoras sociales de Estados Unidos, como quienes, como Women Care, en donde eh, nos enseñaron la magia de conocer nuestro cuerpo, pero también la magia de defenderlo. Um, from all these groups, we, I started to advise um, as a lawyer, formally and informally, as an advisor and sometimes as a formal lawyer, and I work on human rights, uh, establishing bridges with um, counterparts in the United States, such as Women Care. Uh, they helped us to understand the magic of our fight and the magic of our bodies as well. Como ocurriera también con Planned Parenthood y con como ocurriera también con Woman Right, White Right, con quien eh, se hizo la campaña por desaparecer la petición de la toalla sanitaria, logrando efectivamente eh, prohibir el que se pidiera la toalla sanitaria en las industrias maquiladoras. Um. As well, we work with Planned Parenthood, with Women Right Watch, and, and others with um, like a binational network uh, for attention to the violence. Especially with um, Women Rights Watch, we uh, got advice to fight for the prohibition to protest the, the, the use of the um, sanitary pad inspections in the maquiladoras. Y en el proyecto justamente de lo que se convirtió el grupo Factor X del cual soy fundadora y que eh, retomó los proyectos sobre todo de la defensa de los derechos de las mujeres desde el tema de la salud, pero también desde los derechos laborales. And from the Factor X, Factor X group that I am part of, um, we started to defend the um, women's health and also labor labor rights of women. Y, y es justamente desde donde se hacen campañas eh, estatales, se juntan los grupos en Baja California, nos juntamos con el grupo de las mujeres que tenían una organización 
en San Quintín. Y eh, empezamos a enarbolar una agenda global de defensa de los derechos de las mujeres indígenas, pero de las mujeres de las traba, trabajadoras de la maquila y, en, y en de las jornaleras agrícolas. Y una campaña que subsiste todavía y que ha dado, eh, eh, que ha prohijado leyes en el tema de la violencia y la discriminación en Baja California. Later, we started to uh, make campaigns in the state and to join other groups, such as women in San Quintin, uh, uh, women who work in the fields, indigenous women. And we joined together the Maquila women with the indigenous women who work on the fields to create actual laws to prevent violence and aggression against women in the whole state. Esto, evidentemente, desde eh, la posibilidad de construir, construir propuestas desde los diferentes grupos como mujeres feministas que hemos logrado eh, poner y colocar una agenda en Baja California de manera conjunta aprovechando la experiencia de actoras sociales de Estados Unidos. And inspire on the experience of, uh social actors in the United States, uh, we have evidently uh, been building proposals to, um, to create a feminist women agenda in Baja California. En el tema de la salud, esto resulta un, un, un elemento fundamental. No solamente porque a través de recursos para protección a, sal, a la salud pudimos llevar condones, pero literatura de conocimiento que no tenían las mujeres en las colonias pero también a través de la creación de herramientas para la protección contra la violencia como la línea 911, que fue a partir de mujeres como Marisa Ugarte, que participó de la construcción del 911 aquí, de aquí en Chula Vista. We, um, promoting women's health uh, was crucial in the neighborhoods because we, uh, at first, we started to distribute condoms, but at the same time, we uh, distributed literature and gave women the tools to counteract violence. We created the um, Linea 911 uh, with the help of by Marisa Ugarte from the United States. Y quiero terminar con esto. Como defensora de derechos humanos y como abogada, uno de los factores muy importantes que ha generado no solamente la posibilidad de hacer leyes, uh, de llevar herramientas a las mujeres en la, en, del pueblo, en las colonias, ha sido la posibilidad de poder capacitar a servidores y servidoras públicas a partir de un proyecto compartido con Plan Parenthood que fue la primera capacitación que en 50 años se dio para pre atención y prevención de la violencia hacia las mujeres desde una plataforma feminista. And I would like to finish with this. Uh, as a human rights lawyer and as a lawyer, uh, it is very important for me to tell you that making laws, creating laws is, is Um, an important step for giving tools for women in different neighborhoods to fight for their rights. And the most important thing also was to train this collaboration we had with Planned Parenthood to train government workers and government officers on those, uh, on how to apply those laws and how to make them uh, be respected. And I would like to close. With Compartiendo, evidentemente, siempre de mi experiencia, esta experiencia fronteriza que permite no empezar a inventar algo que ya existe de este lado, pero también hermanar los movimientos a través del esfuerzo personal o institucional, como el día de hoy. Por ello, gracias por permitirnos tender puentes. Muchas gracias por permitirnos hermanar lo que las mujeres necesitan de aquel lado y de este. Muchas gracias. important thank you very much for me to I, we're not inventing a new solution uh, we are bridging uh, solutions through the, the the border and it's very important for us thinking in the personal bridges that we have 
constructed and the institutional ones like today that we are here face to face talking about these issues and uh, constructing this sisterhood across the border. Thank you. Okay, that was a really our, our first panelist member. Um, Amalia Tello Torralba is, las, is this, the next presenter. She is a Mistec from the state of Oaxaca, which is an indigenous uh, ethnicity. Uh, she is a leader of the Valle de San Quintin, and I would say she's a leader of women in the Valle de San Quintin, founder of the Casa de la Mujer, of the House of the Women in San Quintin, and fundamental for the organization of women in San Quintin. She is a, a, pro a producer, a, a bilingual producer um, on the radio and has two radio programs, one for children and one for women in, in, in the afternoon for women, in the morning for children. And uh, she doesn't say it here, but I know it was very important to her, so I will say it. She was the coordinator of a book on farm workers in San Quintin, which came out last year. Thank you, Amaz. Gracias. Quiero hacerles esta pequeña presentación de la organización de la cual pertenezco. I want to do this uh, small presentation about the organization I belong to. You want me to translate the title of the... Okay, yeah, that's okay. Next. We are an organization of indigenous women. We have 11 members and we speak tricky, tricky language. We speak Mixteco from the higher region in um, the Mixteca and the lower region of the Mixteca is called Mixteco Alto and Bajo. Um, our mission is that we are an organization, a women organization an indigenous women organization who, who are looking for contributing so women will live a life without uh, gender violence and they can decide uh, in a free and informed way, uh, way about their bodies, their sexuality, and, and everybody respects their rights as workers and as uh, workers in the fields, the agricultural fields. Is the Naxi Nisena? Is that Mixteco? Mujeres en Defensa de la Mujer. The top part is in Mixteco, and the name is uh, Women Defending Other Women. Y estos son nuestros proyectos. And these are their projects. Uh, they have... Uh, usted puede explicarlo si quiere. Okay, sí. Nací, nachinche, nací. Nací, son las mujeres. That's uh, how she's uh, telling us how the, the name is pronounced in Mixteco, mm -hmm. which is an indigenous mm -hmm. language in Mexico. Yeah. Pues, muy buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Eh, es un gusto para mí estar aquí en la Universidad de San Diego. Gracias a, por la invitación. Gracias a la doctora Liz por esta invitación. Y el día de hoy es un gusto pues compartir con ustedes un poco la situación de la mujer indígena migrante y asentada en Baja California, pero en específico en San Quintín. Thank you very much. Thank you to Professor Liz Mayer for inviting me. Thank you everybody. Oh, thank you everybody for inviting me. I would like to talk about the situation of uh, women agricultural workers in the region of San Quintín. Muy bien. Wait, is that ¿Se escucha? Sí. No more slides. Ya, yeah, ya, yeah. ok. Bueno, eh, voy a hablar un poco sobre la, la migración. Este es un factor que afecta a comunidades indígenas, pero muy en especial a las mujeres. El emigrar a otro lugar desconocido para ellas resulta un proceso muy difícil, ya que pues tendrán que dejar parte de su pertenencia cultural en su pueblo natal. Um, I am going to talk about immigration, which is a factor affecting a lot of indigenous women because they have to leave a lot of their cultural 
uh, heritage in their in, in the process of crossing and in their place where they came from. Bien. Eh, por la falta de trabajo en sus comunidades de origen, se ven obligadas a dejar su pueblo y su tierra para encontrar mejores condiciones de vida. La mayoría parte, la mayor parte este, viaja con su familia o bien solas. El trabajo agrícola ofrecido por las grandes corporaciones este, agrícolas que exportan sus productos a Estados Unidos, o sea, a estos lugares y a otros países, atraen a las mujeres indígenas y a sus familias, lo que hace que transiten, transiten de sus pueblos o comunidades de origen hacia estos lugares y, y a varios estados de la República Mexicana. The lack of job opportunities that indigenous women have in their uh, places of origin uh, pushes them to, to leave and pursue a travel either alone or with their families and pursue these opportunities that those big agricultural companies offer in um, cultivating different, different crops uh, that are for export, to the, especially to the United States. Uh, these became very attractive to indigenous women that they find um, opportunities for employing themselves and making resources for their families. Bien. Este, esto lo hacen con la finalidad de trabajar por temporadas, arribando por Sinaloa, Sonora, Baja California. Y este viaje, este, frecuentemente es preocupante para la familia que dejan en su pueblo natal y para ellas mismas. Uh, they usually engage in seasonal work in different areas in Mexico, like Sinaloa, Sonora, Baja California, and they leave their families behind in, in uh, and their, their families and their towns behind. Bien, sobre todo para las mujeres que viajan solas, ya que durante el trayecto pasan por diferentes violaciones o situaciones que ponen en riesgo su integridad, su seguridad y mayormente son acosadas sexualmente, ya sea por el chofer de, el chofer de transporte o por un pasajero compañero de ellas, quien también viaja solo, pero si viajan acompañadas de su familia, vienen con un poquito más de seguridad. When these women travel alone, they are subjected to harassment, sexual harassment from travel companions or even the, the, um, the conductors of the transport they use to travel. Uh, that's what they are sexually harassed often, sexually assaulted uh, sometimes. And that's why sometimes they decide to, to immigrate, to migrate with the whole family. So they, they can be a little bit safer. Bien. Otro de los problemas a la que las mujeres migrantes se enfrentan al situarse en algunas colonias urbanas o ejidos, este, al rentar un cuarto muy pequeño de 4x4, esto no garantiza que vivan con tranquilidad o privacidad porque se ven obligadas a soportar los escándalos de los vecinos. Me refiero a que conviven con otras personas que también rentan otro cuarto y... Este tiene, est estos cuartos o esto sí son de un solo dueño y bueno a veces eh, tienen que soportar pues eh, estos um, escándalos que, que más adelante les voy a mencionar. Um, when they establish themselves in their places where they work, either in the countryside or in, a, in neighborhoods in cities. They have to rent small rooms, very, very small rooms uh, where they have no privacy. They have to deal with the neighbors and usually they have to deal with the owners of those rooms that, that are especially rented for, this, uh, for uh, moving workers. And they have to deal with noise and with other problems that I am going to talk to you about right now. A pesar de la violencia y la discriminación constante que se enfrentan a diario, las mujeres indígenas han pues, aprendido a luchar de manera in, incansable para poner fin a las exclusiones, al racismo y a la discriminación que día a día se enfrentan tanto en donde viven como en instituciones de salud y así como en el trabajo. Despite the violence and discrimination that they have had to endure, uh, we, indigenous women fight tirelessly for, to end the discrimination that they have to face in the institutions of health that serve them, that are supposed to serve them and in their workplaces as well. 
Ante estos atropellos se empiezan a exigir y a poner un alto a la violencia de género y el racismo que padecen tanto en, ellas lo padecen tanto en dependencias de gobierno como en las comunidades en donde viven, sobre todo en sus hogares, ya sea por el esposo, por el hermano o por el papá. To stop these problems, they have been proactively fighting to stop racism, institutional racism and discrimination from different government institutions and social institutions, but in their own homes, they also have to endure violence coming from the male members of, of their families, their brothers, their fathers, and their spouses. Ahora hablaré un poquito sobre el trabajo de la mujer. La razón principal por la que decenas de, de miles de personas nacidas en el sur del país, llegan al Valle de San Quintín, ha sido pues el deseo de una vida mejor que vieron posible en sus comunidades de origen. En el Valle encontraron mejores condiciones de vida, con un empleo precarizado e inhumano, pero al fin también encontraron eh, trabajo y un poquito mejor vida, claro, con un salario muy bajo. La, la carecía de seguridad social, la, las inexistencias jornadas de trabajo y, bueno, un sinfín de, de violaciones a sus derechos laborales que se han presentado día a día. And I'm going to talk about the women's work in Baja California. Uh, many women have to have from the south of the country to, to work in places like San Quintín, where they have found they, they are looking for a better life and they have found employment uh, and in some ways they have ha they have found an income but they also have had to face discrimination in human conditions low salaries uh, lack of social security and long labor days very long labor days en los campos agrícolas de este sus derechos laborales son violentados, no les pagan las horas extras ni los días festivos, casi no tienen vacaciones, tampoco el derecho a guardería, mucho menos a ser aseguradas ante el Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social. Um, in the agricultural fields in San Quintín, they have no practically no labor rights, they have uh, no access to childcare. Uh, no um, extra time payment, and they have no, no security also. Esto es tan solo por mencionar algunos derechos que se encuentran establecidos en la Ley Federal del Trabajo. Trabajan sin protección. Cuando se accidentan en el lugar de trabajo, no, les, no, le, no las atienden de inmediato porque no le pueden exigir. Ellas no pueden decir nada. Lo hacen de, no lo hacen de inmediato, no la llevan al doctor, se quedan sin empleo a veces. Otra, porque no conocen sus derechos, así sea accidente de trabajo, se quedan sin atención médica y sin incapacidad. Um, despite the fact that the labor law protects these women, they might not know their rights, and in case they have an accident in the work, um, they might be fired because of of incapacity, uh, they might not have access to the doctor or to any kind of health help, um, no medical help, because they they might not know about the protections they have in the law. Bien, también otro de los derechos violentados es que no se les proporciona herramientas y materiales necesarios para la realización de su trabajo, y esto en ocasiones repercute en su salud física. Además, toda la jornada hay, hay que soportarla, hay que soportar el frío, el calor, eh, la sed, sobre todo cuando les dan agua, les dan agua en un termo en donde no tiene higiene casi, tienen que usar un solo vaso para todos los trabajadores que vienen siendo de 20 a 30 personas. Well, while they are on the fields, they have no access to the proper materials to perform their work. Uh, they are affected on the, those are long days in exposed to the elements, to the cold or to the sun, picking crops. Uh, they usually, when they also don't have access to clean water, they usually have a thermos to share uh, among 30 different people with no hygiene or no hygienic conditions in the fields. 
y sobre todo también el recibir los insultos de los mayordomos como qué torpe eres porque no entiendes lo que te digo, si no lo haces, si no lo haces bien, mañana ya no hay trabajo para ti, eh, sin garantizar sobre todo la salud de las mujeres jornaleras. And on top of it, they have to endure the insults of their managers who said, uh, you are dumb, uh, you are not working enough, you're not working hard enough. And on top of it, they have, on top of this, they have to, uh, all those things put in jeopardy the health of the women who are working in the fields. Bien. Eh, por ejemplo, las mujeres se enfrentan a varias situaciones para el corte de jitomate cherry, se le llama, el pepino, el ejote, entre otras frutas y hortalizas que son, crecen altas y requieren de zancos para este, poderlos alcanzar y cortar estas frutas. Eh, a veces se caen y se fracturan sin, sin tener pues ese, ese apoyo. También eh, tienen que, que soportar el hostigamiento sexual de parte de los mayordomos, de este, el apuntador, de los regadores y hasta de los transportistas que las llevan a su lugar del trabajo, lo cual ellas callan, no pueden denunciar, tienen miedo a perder su trabajo. Um, to harvest certain things like cherry, tomatoes, cucumbers and green beans, you need to be working on stilts and sometimes women fell off from the stilts and they have fractures and they have you know, concussions and, and problems. But on top of this, they don't uh, uh, usually access uh, health, um, medical help after an accident like this. And on top of this, they have to endure, if they complain, they have to endure the harassment, sexual and all sorts of harassments from the male co-workers, the persons who, who do the, um, the additional work around the fields and even the persons who transport them to the fields um, and their supervisors. Bien, otro de los problemas que las mujeres indígenas, trabajadoras o jornaleras agrícolas se eh, sufren es de que eh, no gozan de la licencia de maternidad para nada, este, no cuentan con acta de nacimiento para recibir con esto un apoyo del gobierno federal o cualquier otro apoyo que el gobierno brinda a las eh, mujeres indígenas. An extra problem that indigenous women coming from the south working on San Quintín might have is that uh, they don't have access to maternity leave when they need it, and some of them don't have birth certificates, and therefore they cannot access government programs uh, to take care of their children or take care of their needs. Bien. Pues la organización así eh, se creó precisamente eh, a partir de que, como todas fuimos jornaleras, actualmente ya no trabajamos en el campo, pero nos organizamos para poder ayudar a nuestras compañeras trabajadoras agrícolas del Valle de San Quintín. Y lo que hacemos es canalizar, orientar, acompañar a la mujer que no habla el español y así poderla ayudar. Uh, due to all these problems, that's how I see the organization that I work for was created. Maybe the members, some of the members of the organization no longer work on the fields, but we all have done it. And our work is to uh, uh, link women to places that can, uh, that can offer help, like clinics and uh, government institutions that may help them, especially for this group of women interpreters in their indigenous languages. También comentarles un poquito sobre la educación de la mujer indígena no no puede estudiar porque el trabajo no se lo permite. Actualmente las mamás indígenas son las que apoyan a sus hijas más jóvenes y estas jóvenes son las que quieren estudiar porque hay madres solteras, entonces ellas se preocupan por sus hijos y darle una mejor vida y es por eso y también ellas dejar de trabajar en el surco para que para poder obtener un poquito más de recurso y sacar adelante a sus hijos. Something that we have observed is that women uh, who work on the fields who might not have the, had the opportunity to study because they they work all day, uh, the mo uh, 
those women who are mothers usually want their children, their female children to, to study and to have more opportunities so they, they don't have to work on the, on the fields like them. El, el, el pago que recibe el esposo, por ejemplo, no le alcanza para, para este, solventar los gastos o cubrir todos los gastos de, de la familia. Entonces, eh, un poco en cuestiones de la economía, la mujer lo que hace es buscar por sus propios medios como hacer comida, vender tamales, pozole, hacer lonche, por ejemplo, tener abonados. Eh, hombres solos que se vienen a trabajar a, a Baja California y les preparan sus lunches y, y así es como obtienen un poco de dinero y poder ayudar a, a la familia. Usually the, the male heads of the households don't make enough money to support the whole household, the children, and women on top of their activities on the fields, they also do additional activities such as preparing food like pozole, tamales, and they have, um, uh, they tend to a group of men who come to work on the fields, they call them abonados, which they pay in installments every month, they pay for their food, so they prepare food for these men who work on the fields as well. So uh, with these activities, they help the household e economy. Lo que a estas mujeres les preocupa mucho es Um, apoyar económicamente a sus hijos y a sus hijas porque como les decía el, lo que el marido gana no le alcanza porque además este, estos señores hay unos muy jóvenes que es, se vuelven drogadictos al alcohol y, y bueno eh, a otro tipo de droga que ahí es en donde invierten su dinero y obvio no les alcanza el dinero para cubrir los gastos y es por eso que la mamá o la mujer se ve obligada a realizar otro tipo de actividad para así obtener un poco de recurso. These women are particularly worried about their children because they're, uh, they, the male, some of their male partners spend their money in drugs, which is a growing problem, or in alcohol, and therefore they have to look for additional activities, economic activities to support the family and especially the children. Y es por eso que las mujeres indígenas de todo México, o todo, sí, de todo México, este, eh, piden que se, que se reconozca y se oficialice el Día Internacional de la Mujer Indígena para visibilizar los problemas a que ellas se enfrentan día a día y que el Día Internacional de la Mujer pues, se, 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 se vea visibilizado. That's why indigenous women in all Mexico are asking to establish the uh, International Indigenous Women's Day so our problems are more visible and uh, especially the problems that we have, particularly to our groups, are more visible. También lo que, lo que analizamos y pedimos las mujeres indígenas es que se asigne se asignen presupuestos para fomentar la participación y organización de las mujeres indígenas. Another thing that we ask for is that we get a budget assigned to develop uh, programs for leadership and participation so we can uh, have a, a bigger voice. También lo que se pide es que se garanticen los derechos humanos y laborales de todas las mujeres trabajadoras de los campos agrícolas y, y también del hogar. We also want uh, labor rights and the women rights of all the women who work in the fields uh, to be respected and also to be respected the, for the activities that they do, the additional activities they do in, in their homes. Otra de las cosas es que la, las políticas públicas sean diseñadas e implementadas con perspectiva de género e interculturalidad para que se garantice un trabajo digno y respetuoso para todas las mujeres indígenas. We also want public policy to be designed uh, with an intercultural and gender lens in mind, so we have uh, res uh, respect for the activities of indigenous women. Muchas gracias, y yo espero que este puente nos sirva como para también reforzar un poquito el trabajo que las mujeres venimos haciendo a favor de las mujeres. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias, Amalia. Thank you very much, and I hope that this is also a bridge to reinforce the work we have been doing for all women. Thank you. You know, uh, every time I buy 
a little package of organic blackberries, which at the most has 15 blackberries in it and is $5. I think about the women, I'm gonna cry, working in the fields for $8 a day. $8 a day, when they sell this for $5 a little box. So now I'm going to present Flor Arvallo. Um, Flor is, I think I'm going to present her. Almost, <laughs> almost presenting her, almost presenting her. Flor was my colega in, in the Colegio de la Frontera, in, in, the, in the College of, of Baja California, in the north of, of, of Mexico, the frontera and the northern border, the northern border, yeah. Uh, she's a feminist activist for women's rights. She has a master's uh, of public uh, studies from the University of Nor uh, New South Wales in Sydney. She worked for Amnesty International and at COLEF and now works for a state secretariat as the head of communications. Uh, she's going to speak, uh, her title, the title of her talk is Lesbians on the Move for Human Rights. And uh, uh, I think the second part of it was the lost lesbian in LGBT. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> well, I really didn't know um, what to make of this presentation, so I'm just going to give it my best shot. Um, first of all, I want to thank um, Liz for always inviting me. I keep telling her I'm not an academic and I'm far from it, but uh, I learned a lot in Colef from other academics, uh, such as Silvia Lopez and also Norma Iglesias over there. Uh, I learned a lot from them, mostly because I was a TV host and I had to interview them about their uh, research topics. So I know a lot about, I know a little bit about a lot of things. But well, anyways, um, I would like to say that uh, what I'm here to share with you today is part of my own experience. It's part of the support of my feminist colleagues and it's also part I stole from my uh, wife's doctoral thesis. So um, don't tell her that, but um, she's a graduate from Al Colef too and uh, she's the real expert on these topics. And in reality, I'm, I'm here to talk about uh, a little bit about the the scenario for LGBTQ folks in Tijuana, mostly uh, where I live. Uh, but first of all, well, as I, as Liz said, um, I did a master's in public policy studies in, in Sydney, which also gave me a different perspective on how, um, how different um, things uh, changed the perspective from where you're standing. And I think, uh, it's hard to follow Amalia because now I think that most of my issues are just not relevant. Uh, but um, anyways, uh, I, I, for a few years now, um, I, I started working with uh, human rights uh, in Amnesty International. Obviously, that's uh, an organization that has a very different platform than uh, any organization in Mexico. And it has another structure and obviously it has different budgets than most of the NGOs in Mexico. So uh, I, I got that experience in San Francisco and the Bay Area. So that's where I really started thinking about the issues that uh, affected women, LGBT people and everything. And um, that's when I also started uh, fighting for uh, the right of legal abortion. That's really the thing that I, I have worked most on. But um, for a few years now, uh, when I came out as a lesbian, um, it was very different. It, it, it's really difficult for me to talk about uh, things be as a lesbian because it's so abstract. And at the same time, I think of it as a political stand when you describe yourself or you enunciate yourself as a lesbian. So for a long time, I was very wary of saying that, you know, and I just didn't really come to terms with it. But um, for most of my life, I live under the heterosexual regime. I grew as a heterosexual woman. I made my life in general as a heterosexual woman. I married a man. I had a daughter. And I fulfilled everything that was expected of me as a woman. And it was uh, from motherhood that I decided to take uh, kind of control of my life and my sexuality. And I came out of the closet, uh, or as I like to say, I freed myself from heterosexuality. And um, everything changed, and it changed in a lot of way, ways, not only um, in, a, in a, yeah, but you know, you can go to the next one. Um, 
and, and then, you know, it kind of changed because I understood a lot of the violences and the discrimination that I wasn't aware of for a long time. And not only because I was assumed as a straight woman, but because of class, uh, because of race, because of uh, education and all those things that I didn't really think about a lot in my life. And as soon as I started presenting myself as a lesbian, I became not just a mom, I was a lesbian mom. And then I was not just a professional, I was a lesbian professional. And then I was not just a women's rights activist, now I was a lesbian women's rights activist. And then all these labels uh, started coming to me without me really looking for them or even understanding what they meant. And um, I didn't really know what a lesbian activist and a mother was supposed to do. So again, I just kind of uh, improvised. Um, and so in that sense, um, there are many women in Baja California, and especially uh, the ones that I've met in Tijuana and all that have preceded me. And I think Liz and Minerva and everybody uh, that is a little bit older than me. Um, have met and have, you know, uh, seen the work that they've done in favor of LGBT uh, rights. But every, every activist that I've met and all the people that I've met during this time that have uh, a little bit of interest or a lot of interest in what is right, what is socially uh, just, what is uh, fair, and all the things that we can see through a feminist lens also, um, it's not easy to uh, engage in political activism and in this kind of activism in a city like Tijuana. Uh, a lot of people have given their lives for this fight and there has a lot of, uh, there has been a lot of women and trans women particularly that have died for this uh, cause and trying to talk about the LGBTQ um, plus rights. Um, if you, uh, I think you can see. Stay with that. <laughs> um, there are a few things we must remember when speaking about lesbians and our activisms, and that is that first of all, we are women. And unlike gay men, in the case of lesbians and trans women, there are other types of violences that intersect in our lives because we're women. And yes, trans women are women. As women, we face heteronormativity and patriarchy. We are women who do not reproduce the roles imposed on us, particularly in regards to reproduction and any of the stereotypical roles of what it means to be a woman. Therefore, our alliances in most cases have been interwoven with the feminist movement and trans movement than with that of the mainstream LGBT community. It has been a very contentious relationship because as I said, lesbian are women. Um, and misogyny is something that is still present in the LGBT community in Tijuana and probably in all spheres <laughs> at large. A uh, few lesbian women have been recognized for their work on behalf of other women and women rights, so much so that there is, uh, and this is from my wife's thesis, so I'm sorry, I just have to quote her. Um, there is a policy of silence, and this is um, due to a history of violence, repression by the police, repression by the authorities, repression of company, society, and this has resulted in lesbian women often preferring to go on notice, so not to suffer discrimination or to be victims of hate crimes. Um, you can go to the next one. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tijuana, uh, you can go to the next slide. Well, that's part of what I was saying. Um, well, that's Mariel Franco, who died recently, <laughs> last year, and also um, Nicole Saavedra in Chile, who was also a victim of a hate crime. And if you go to the next one, I can move along. And I'm sorry, I'm, I know that this is about building bridges and I really want you to come to Tijuana, but I really have to talk about what is not told about our great city and about Baja California. And this is, uh, Baja California has been uh, portrayed as the city of sin, as a great uh, city to go and have fun. And we even have these tales about the donkey show and all those fun things that you can do in Tijuana. But uh, what history has not told us is that, and not told a lot of people, is that for a lot of people living on the fringes and dealing with not being part of the norm, Tijuana is a very dangerous city. Uh, Baja California, as the home of many migrants from all parts of Mexico, uh, instead of being a source of openness, freedom, and rights, it has been built under the control of a right-wing party. 
uh, which so far continues to fight the battle for not only political control of the state, but the life of women, and not to mention their ideas about the non-heterosexual community. Tijuana is a city that has been cataloged as a city of freedom and debauchery and partying and disorder. However, what is not really told is that under the mandate of our recent governments, the logic of political parties has enabled this story about Tijuana, because we live in a city that is known for its double standards when it comes to sexual freedom. Tijuana is a city where sex is hyper-consumed, but we don't have or have had sexual freedom. In other words, we do not have a law on legal abortion. In our current law, against discrimination. Discrimination based on sexual orientation is not emphasized or even mentioned. Such violences continue to be invisible. This imaginary of Tijuana is built from the perspective of an individual who thinks that sexual freedom has to do with the ability to consume sex work for a few bucks. Tijuana is seen as a Hollywood movie where everything is allowed, but paradoxically, sexual freedom, especially for the LGBTQ community, is not a reality. Tijuana is a city that is largely sustained by the sweat and the oppression of sexual workers, particularly women. And what that has meant for lesbian in our little regular lesbian lives, as I said, we, um, we face different types of violences. Um, lesbians in Tijuana, we face violences depending on our gender expression, uh, what we call passing, which in my experience, we share a lot with trans uh, women who have told us that depending on how feminine they look or how much they can pass as women or how lesbians can be feminine in their expression is the amount of discrimination they will face. I am not comparing at all our experiences because they're quite different, but as I said in the beginning, we share a lot with them, especially when it comes to misogyny. And having said that, uh, many lesbian women do not have access to proper health services. They are subject to male-oriented health policies that keep them away from getting consults, pap smears, or even going to have a regular checkup can be a hassle for them. In Baja California, affirmative actions have to be litigated one by one in federal courts because the judges are not ready to understand them or do not have the willingness to do it. The services provided to vulnerable groups are not certified by basic hygiene standards. Rehabilitation centers or nursing homes where many LGBTQ people end their lives due to lack of family care and public services are in terrible conditions. It is a vicious, vicious circle because the services offered by bars, clinics, and spaces where the LGBT community is served are private services that are paid for, but where discrimination is experienced anyway, because in Mexico, consumer rights do not have the same importance and leverage as they do here in the United States. Uh, discrimination in the workplace, informal jobs, and the violence and hate crimes. And it may sound like I'm talking about the 80s, but um, what is hap this is happening today to a lot of colleagues. And just to go um, finish up with this, um, Marriage equality has been a struggle in Baja California, mainly because of the right-wing party that used to uh, govern our state for a long time, and that even with the so-called left party that is now um, in, in, the, um, in power, uh, very conservative groups have still maintained that we can do anything, we can kiss and we can go about our little pride uh, walks and whatever, but we're not getting married. And, you know, that's the limit that they have established for us. And this is uh, two of my uh, friends are also activists, and they've been very uh, visible in trying to get marriage equality passed. And Meritella and Nancy, they, um, they started um, a campaign that was called Ya Casa Las Doc. And this is because the major of Tijuana, the, one of the majors of Tijuana was actually a medical doctor. And so they started making this campaign, asking him uh, to marry them without the safe passing of a legal, in, which is a legal instrument that we had to do in order to get married. And it went uh, all over the internet and it went all over the world. And a lot of people from everywhere started saying, you know, uh, asking the major to please uh, get them married. So that didn't happen, of course. Um, <laughs> so that didn't happen. But uh, now um, uh, my partner and I got married last year and we did have to go to the Human Rights Commission where Minerva works. And uh, they had to give us uh, this little paper where we were able to get married. And, uh, but now they've changed. And in um, March 21st, they are finally getting married without having to do any extra paperwork. And so it's not still in the law and we're still being discriminated. We do not have the same rights as uh, heterosexual or straight people do. We still have to go through a lot of hurdles and, and we have to explain why we have to 
uh, why we want to get married and why we want to have all the basic rights and civil rights and everything, even for social and medical care, we still have to do more paperwork as a lesbian couple than any other straight couple. So I just want to say, and, and, and this is the, every, uh, the end of it, is that I really want to uh, invite everybody to question your privileges and try to understand that what it seems obvious um, for a lot of people is not, for, is not obvious and it's not real for a lot of us. And um, it's not common sense, it's not written in the law, and especially for all those who are gender non-conforming, binary, queer, trans, lesbian, gay, or any gender dissidents, we still face discrimination and it's something that we still need to talk about and work on. Thank you. La, uh, la, la siguiente, uh, I'm sorry, the last, <laughs> the next and last presenter uh, in our panel and afterwards we just have a, like a two minute video that's going to show the, uh, the rapist is you movement, which is all over, it's even in the United States, and I, it's really worth, worth seeing. So, and worth hearing is my colleague, Dr. Silvia Lopez, she's a sociologist, professor at COLEF. Um, she does research on family work and gender, gender and public policy affairs. She's a pro, uh, the program coordinator of the PhD in cultural studies at the Colegio, she recently named, and this is her new, I, I really appreciate all, everyone's participation, but at, in this moment, especially Silvia, because she has a lot of work, Everyone else has a ton of work, and Amalia came from five hours away. So that's just saying. Um, she participates with a working group on, oh, she participated, and this is going to be part of her, her um, uh, talk, her uh, presentation, is uh, she participated in the working group on the gender alert uh, for, for gender violence, particularly for femi femicide or feminicide, you're going to have to tell me which it is in English, I, I've heard it both ways, uh, in Baja California. Um, she's published many books about gender policies, said some, but many books about gender policies in Mexico, and uh, has an enormous amount of articles, and um, was in the march, uh, and has a daughter who marches in the streets demanding rights, and so does she. She just did Sunday, as did Minerva, and I don't know, were you there? Yes. Good. With Everybody. Daughter. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sylvia Lopez. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, please. Well, I feel some pressure because I'm the last one, and I don't know how many times. Okay. Uh, well, my presentation is about the femicide and the gender-based alert against women violence in Mexico and in Baja California. Some weeks ago, a 20-year-old woman was found hand-tied and dead in a plastic bag in Tijuana. This is the one of the many cases that are part of the femicide in the state of Baja California. Alejandra. Sorry. Ale Argelia. I can't do this. <laughs> Alejandra, Argelia, Sofia, Maria, Teresa, Marbella are the names of some of the murder women in this border city recently. Thank you. This is so much for me. Uh, okay, well, uh, here um, we have some uh, numbers. In Mexico, 66% of women aged 15 and older were victims of some type of violence, uh, physical, emotional, sexual, and economical. Every day, 10 women are victims of femicide in Mexico. Uh, this January, 73 femicides occurred in the country. And to this day, there were 19 women murdered in Tijuana and 63 in the state of Baja California. So uh, in the following uh, slide, uh, please, um, I had some numbers and uh, 
um, the intention is to show uh, uh, the situation in terms of uh, the the women intentional homicides. We have the the numbers for for uh, the whole country and for Baja California. And uh, uh, in comparison, we can see the, uh, that a few of these cases are uh, typified as femicides. And we also can see that in 2018 and 2019, we have a change for the state of Baja California. Uh, we uh, did have before two and three cases uh, typified as femicide. And in this year, the, the, the number increased to 27 and 23. And uh, uh, why is this situation? Why is this change? Uh, it was because of that woman in part, of because the, the lawyer, Minerva Najera, because uh, she works at the National Commission of Human Rights and she uh, participated in a panel with uh, some public uh, officers to, to discuss uh, uh, the situation and, and to promote the use of uh, gender protocols when investigating the uh, intentional, the women's intentional uh, homicides. And um, so this is why we, we had a change. Then um, impunity, misogyny, and political issues are some of the obstacles to classify in ten, intentional homicides, women intentional homicides as femicides. But uh, well, uh, our hope is that the situation uh, will change. Um, another uh, statistics in Baja California, women have no access to justice from 120 allegations uh, uh, only 40 men were found guilty, 90, uh, 29 got sentence, sentences for homicide, and only 11 got penalties for this crime, for femicide, I mean. Um, so um, this is very important. Um, um, in the last 25 years, Me Mexico developed a set of public policies to prevent, attend, and sanction the gender violence against women as a part of the commitments that the federal government signed with international treaties. But I also have to say that uh, this is also thanks to the uh, work of feminists and uh, women's grassroots in Mexico for more than three decades. So uh, we now have a gender mainstreaming uh, thanks to, to this uh, uh, women's movement. And uh, one of the policies uh, is the, the general law of women access to ally free of violence. Uh, this law is the product of a national study was, that uh, was carried out in 2006 by the anthropologist, and at that time she was a congressman, Marcela Lagarde, and um, this study was carried out in 10 different states of Mexico, Baja California one, uh, among them, and the, the, the study I'm to to learn the state of violence against women. The general law uh, was created as a product of this study. And this is one of the first legislations against uh, femicide uh, that was formulated in America Latina. Uh, it's a Bangor law, I could say, because it defines the concept of femicide violence as well as the types and modalities of violence cons considering public and private spheres. In this way, um, the conceptualization goes beyond um, domestic violence. And most important, it includes the mechanism of gender-based alert 
uh, which is supposed to be a affirmative action for women. And we can now go to uh, the, the, the previous, the previous, okay. No, so this is a set of actions. Uh, it's supposed to be emergency actions to face and eradicate uh, femicide in a specific territory. And uh, the aims are to guarantee women's security, to halt violence against women, and to eradicate, eradicate the inequities produced by legislation that prevents women's human rights. Sorry about my bad pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, in the following slide, I, uh, um, this is a very bureaucratic process. So I, I show here very quickly. And um, this is what we did in the working group I was part of when the alert, the gender-based alert was requested in Baja California. So we uh, elaborate a diagnosis of the situation of violence in this territory, and then we send, we elaborate a set of recommendations and send the report to the to the uh, federal government, and in turn the federal government send these uh, uh, recommendations to the state of Baja California that in this case is that decided to accept these recommendations and after a six month period we we dictaminate what was the situation and we found that many of the recommendations were uh, partially full fulfilled and some of them there were not fulfilled at all so uh, but uh, we didn't know why the federal government decided not to declare the the alert. The alert. So, among the recommendation was the creation of databases, uh, gender-based perspective training for public officers, women creation of women shelters, uh, restriction orders, implementation of protocols with a gender-based uh, perspective to investigate investigate femicides and uh, the creation of the Center for Justice, justice to, to, woman, to Women, sorry. Um, um, okay, so this map shows how many other have been, have been declared in, in the country. So it's half the country, but well, there, there are uh, 11 states that have this alert. And uh, in some states, it has been refused, uh, eight states, um, Baja California among them. And there are all, all uh, eight states that, that have uh, uh, this in process. They haven't decided yet. But in general, I would say that the whole country uh, would be, would be um, under the, under the alert. So we can see, um, okay, um, the, go on, please go on, yeah. Oh, no, no, please adv advance, okay, no. Conclusions, okay. The gender-based alert <laughs> might be a good strategy. She says I have two minutes. It helped to create alliances between different social actors. It helped to raise consciousness among citizens about the situation of violence in Baja California and in many regions of Mexico. It also helped to create alliances between different social actors, for instance, between the uh, NGOs and the government, and uh, also some NGOs have collaborated monitoring the actions of local authorities. Uh, but this, uh, this bureaucratic process, uh, some mechanism has uh, um, limits, uh, uh, territorial and, and temporary limits. But uh, in practice, we can see that the, these actions in, involve uh, results in, in the mid and long run, you know. So 
still one of the problems is that local and state authorities resist to carry out their responsibilities and there is no political will to prevent, attend and eliminate femicide. The gender-based alert, alert is not enough because femicide continues to, ha to happen all over the country. So I would like to... Um, well, I think that we need an integrated national strategy with the participation of uh, all this society because this is not a problem, uh, a, a women's problem. We need the participation of uh, mass media and uh, uh, families, communities, and workplaces, and uh, we need uh, programs uh, uh, for gender-based education in all uh, scholar levels, so um, also some strategies with entrepreneurs and local authorities to generate a new culture that respects women's rights and lives. So uh, finally, I would like to show something that uh, it was astonishing for me uh, last uh, Sunday. Well, go further, please. Uh, last Sunday, uh, well, um, uh, as violence against women grows every day. Last Sunday, Maestro women marched in the streets of main Mexican cities to protest against the different types of aggression they experience. In Tijuana, citizens, factory workers, academics, feminist collectives, mothers with their children, mothers of the disappeared marched, marched in, the, in the mainly Paseo de los Héroes, one of the main Tijuana avenues and claim the statue of Cuauhtemo. Uh, we can see this picture. It was astonishing for me when I saw this image. This is a, a, a very symbolic gesture against the patriarchal, patriarchal power that rule, rules our lives. So Cuauhtemo was the last Aztec imperial, imperial. So um, this is the end of <laughs> my presentation. Thank you. And some pictures of the march in Tijuana. Okay. November 20th, there was a group of women that organized a performance in the coastal city of Valparaiso. Performance about all of this violence that was going on against women. Gender violence in Latin America is, is clearly an epidemic. Um, and I think that this is why this anthem really resonates among women in the region. It is a moment to finally express on the streets, not only the violence that is lived in the intimate space, but also the violence that happens in the streets. And it's, it's just so common to be afraid in the streets of, of Latin America. So you see this big crowd of women. Um, it, they're like, it's kind of like a feminist line dance. <laughs> and they're all looking at the same place. And they're also kind of like moving back and forth, kind of like dancing or marching. They are blindfolded. They sing at unison. Patriarchy is a judge. And is judging us from the moment we're born. Our punishment is that violence that you're not seeing. It's feminicide. It's rape. It was not my fault, nor where I was, nor how I was dressed. The rapist is you. It's the police. It's the judges. It's the state. It's the president. And so this protest started as a small thing in the city of Valparaiso. Um, 
And then it became huge. It's just like every day you would see like women gathering in corners. There's sometimes like thousands of women uh, in front of uh, symbolic places in Chile to say these lyrics over and over again. And to basically be telling to the authorities, the rapist is you. And by meaning you, it, it, it meant like all of you who are not investigating all of this violence, it is you. It has nothing to do if I had a miniskirt, it is not because I was walking late at night, it is you, it was not my fault. Quisiera dar crédito a, a Floris y Vázquez de, del Colegio de la Frontera Norte. Oh, sorry, I, I'd like to, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, thank Floris y Vázquez from the uh, Northern Border College, the COLEF, uh, for putting together this video because they were really just shots, individual shots. And then we found a, a blog in English, you know, with someone speaking in English, so they had to sort of time the, the dancing in the different places to, uh, to, the, to the words, but she did a fabulous job. And the guy that worked on it, who was like a, a becario, a student there, um, did a fabulous job too. I don't know if you have questions. I just want to say about the El Violador is to video. We performed it in San Diego last November. A group of Chilean girls organized it and we performed it at the Balboa Park as well. So it was not in the video, but it happened here. Oh, wow. I too want to echo my, my appreciation for all of you taking time out of your busy schedules to come here. I wonder if there are any activities that will enhance the sort of cross-cultural uh, connections between other uh, women of color in Baja, California, specifically uh, uh, our Asian sisters in uh, areas like Mexicali, and then also the new wave of African immigrants who are also um, being housed essentially really in um, uh, TJ. As far as I know, there. As far as I know, there are. I don't know about the trans border efforts. I don't know if they are. Does anyone? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sí. Um. Una cosa que quiero decir es el. Um, estas feministas y otras feministas que no fueron invitadas, eh, hemos colocado un, un acento y hecho posibles los crear leyes políticas, eh, también desde una visión inclusiva. ¿sí? Como es lo importante de hacer la, hacerlo desde la plataforma de los derechos humanos. No sé, creo que sí. Sí, nosotras hemos creado leyes inclusivas y. Uh, we have uh, created, thank you, we have created inclusive laws uh, uh, thinking about the diversity of the women communities across the borders. And especially me as a, as a lawyer and working in human rights, uh, I think we. It's, it's very important to take into consideration those populations that you are talking about. And you wanted to say something. Terminar. Y desde ahí hemos hecho esfuerzos de estar todas. Las mujeres migrantes, las mujeres indígenas nativas de Baja California, Y, y tendemos puentes con ellas, pero también las mujeres migrantes de otros países, ¿no? Como 
las haitianas que están eh, en Mexicali, sobre todo, pero que empezaron en Tijuana y con quien hemos, hemos hecho un trabajo pues muy puntual, ¿no? De incluirlas y de tratar de hacer cosas. Algunas mujeres también desde acá lo han hecho. Al, cuando llegaron las haitianas, eh, yo tengo amigas feministas que viven acá, que compraron casas de campaña y mujeres jóvenes que estuvieron yendo todos los días para llevarles bolsas de alimentos a, en esos primeros, primeros momentos. Y yo dediqué todo mi tiempo extra para ir a combatir la discriminación y, y ahora sí que toda la embestida que había desde el Estado en, en contra de las non, personas no nacionales. Uh, we leave that. Uh, we made the effort to integrate Native women from Baja California and immigrants as well. Especially, we have a special relationship with uh, Haitian uh, women who now uh, arrived to Tijuana, but now uh, most of them have moved to Mexicali. Um, and even with the, I, I have worked in the in the side of their human rights, promoting their human rights, and especially abuse, uh, stop the abuse from authorities that they might experience in the hands of authorities. Uh, but also, we have collaborated with women on this side who uh, dedicated their time and their resources and their economic resources to bring uh, camping houses for the women when they were in need, and they brought food. And we establish some uh, mechanisms of cooperation with the women on this side to collaborate with that. Uh, just very briefly, and just to uh, uh, go on this, uh, there are, uh, as she said, a lot of uh, Haitian communities now growing in, in Tijuana, and also uh, a lot of people from Honduras and El Salvador. And this is something that took Tijuana by surprise, and we kind of just civil society kind of organized more than the state and the local authorities to solve this issue. But uh, there are a few uh, shelters that have been established, and I just want to mention uh, two of them. One is uh, Casa Arcoiris, which is uh, the first LGBTQ uh, shelter for migrants. It's just for trans, lesbian, uh, gay, and queer communities that are migrating from Honduras, El Salvador, uh, Hey, she, what, whatever place they can go there. And we saw that because when they arrived with the main caravans, not only from the Haitian caravans, but with the other uh, South American, uh, Central American caravans, we saw that they were subject to other types of violence. And even within the caravan, they were more vulnerable. And so we had, uh, the people who worked on this shelter had to establish uh, safe spaces for the LGBT community. So that's uh, one effort that's there. And, um, um, and uh, it, there's another like little community center called uh, Caracol. Well, the snail, but if you find, if you're gonna find it as Caracol, no, that's snail in Tijuana. And uh, it's also a very grassroots uh, effort. They also do the program um, Food Not Bombs. They, uh, they do that program there, in Clave Caracol, that's the name. And uh, they also have a lot of uh, activities that include, it's not really just feminist spaces, but it's really just inclusive spaces for migrants and for people from all over uh, the place that come to this. It's just safe spaces, I guess you could call it, for migrant communities. Would you like to, I, I would just like to say a, another like a round of applause or happiness for the 50th anniversary of women's studies. It's like really exciting. I can't believe so many years have gone by actually. <laughs> sure. I just wanted to formally end our session. Um, thank you all who made it in person and, and those that have been following the live stream. Our speakers will be here for a little bit longer. I know more people have questions and you can come up and ask them or stay here. And uh, thank you all.
And don't forget to buy your Women's Studies 50th Anniversary merchandise. We've got t-shirts, we've got mugs, we've got notebooks, and we have onesies for those babies in your life.